everyone, welcome back to Talk Blockchain to Me. At this point in 2018, I think we've heard enough about Bitcoin and ICOs and tokens. And I think the growing question on a lot of people's minds are how does this all get regulated? In order to address that question, I've decided to make a two-part series that focus on the regulatory aspects of crypto assets. To give some background, two of the major federal regulatory agencies in the space are the SEC and the CFTC. Broadly speaking, the SEC regulates ICOs and the CFTC regulates virtual currencies. We recently saw the chairman for each of the two agencies testify before the Senate, which means that lawmakers are getting serious about regulating the space. In today's episode, I want to focus on the SEC, what they do, what they have power over, and how that relates to ICOs. The next episode will focus on the CFTC. Before I launch into the discussion, I want to make a couple of really important disclaimers here, which is first, I've previously worked at the SEC, but none of what I'm about to say reflects the official views of the SEC and are my opinions only. Second, and this is super important, none of this is legal advice. So with that out of the way, what is the SEC? The SEC stands for the Securities and Exchange Commission. They are headquartered in Washington, D.C., but have 11 regional offices across the U.S. that all work with each other. Largely speaking, the SEC is a U.S. federal agency with jurisdiction or power over securities and the participants in the marketplace. Examples of securities include things such as stocks or bonds, and market participants refer to the security exchanges, broker and dealers, uh, investment advisors, investment companies, issuers, and investors. The SEC has a three-part mission, which is one, to protect investors, two, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient financial markets, and three, to facilitate capital formation, which is to make capital markets more accessible, making it easy for people to raise money for good business ideas and projects. The SEC is divided into five divisions and 23 offices. For example, there is the Office of Compliance, Inspections, and Examinations, which is probably what you've seen on TV where the SEC will send a bunch of people to go into a bank or a company and examine their financials and other relevant documents and practices to make sure that everything is okay. There is also the Division of Enforcement. They are made up of the lawyers who prosecute the violators of securities law. Within the enforcement division, it is further divided into units that take on a specific area of the law. For example, the market abuse unit covers insider trading, illegal market price manipulation, fraudulent schemes, or any other conduct that would abuse the fairness of the markets. The recently established cyber unit within the enforcement division specifically targets cyber-related misconduct, including violations that involve distributed ledger technology and ICOs. So why have we been seeing so much debate in the crypto space with regards to the SEC? So first things first, cryptocurrencies are not defined as securities as under the law, and thus are not under the SEC's jurisdiction, meaning that the SEC has no power over cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Rather, the SEC has power over securities, which can extend into the ICO and token space. So how does the SEC actually define securities? If you have been following the news in this space, or if you are a law student or a lawyer and you took securities regulation in law school, you may have heard of the Howey test. The Howey test came out of the 1946 Supreme Court case SEC versus W.J. Howey Company, which laid out a four-factor test for judging whether or not something can be classified as a security. An investment contract for purposes of the Securities Act means that a contract transaction or scheme whereby a person, one, invests his money, in two, a common enterprise, and three, is led to expect profits, and four, solely from the efforts of the promoter of a third party. Basically, the Howey test is a test you actually want to fail if you don't want to be considered a security. A lot of debate has been over the third factor, which is around an investor's expectation to make profits. So on one side of the argument, because people buy into ICOs and tokens with the expectation that these tokens will rise in value later on, meaning they can just sell their tokens for a higher price than what they bought it at, this would make the token a security. On the other side of the argument is the obvious opposite, that people aren't buying these tokens 
just to make money. Rather, the tokens are for an actual use case with no expectation of profits. So as you can see, this is actually kind of a gray area, which is why there is so much room for argument. If all tokens are considered to be securities under this Howey test, and there are very strong indications from the SEC saying that they are, that actually is not very good news for a lot of the ICOs out there, because to this day, not a single ICO has registered with the SEC. All securities must register with the SEC, which basically means that you have to file and disclose all that the SEC requires you to. Examples include filing a description of your business and assets of the securities being offered, um, the further details of the offering, description and names of the company's management, and the company's financial statements that have usually been certified by an independent accountant. Of course, the law allows for certain exemptions from registering if you can qualify for it. This means that instead of having to register all of your ICOs and financial information with the SEC, you just need to make one public filing that says that you meet that exemption. Examples of those exemptions are Regulation D, which limits the kind of people you can take money from, or Regulation CF, which limits the amount of money that you can raise. This is also only something that a handful of ICOs have done. So on one hand, we see why ICOs don't want to register with the SEC. It's more paperwork, it's more cost, and it makes it a lot harder to raise money by slowing down that process. On the other hand, being able to raise tons of money with absolutely no obligation to provide any information to the people who are buying your tokens means that there's a lot of room for really bad projects. That creates a lot of room for fraud and for scams, which ultimately end up hurting the investors the most. Without the necessary financial disclosure, how do you even know what you're investing in? Remember that the SEC's whole mission is to protect investors and ensure that financial markets are fair. There are people who are in debt who are taking out additional loans in order to buy into projects that are at best terribly designed and at worst scams to rob you out of your money. At this point, I want to emphasize that there is a lot of really positive things about the ICO fundraising model. And there are a couple of really interesting ICO projects led by really smart people who aren't out there to take all your money and run. But my personal opinion is that regulation is really important because it will force everyone to behave in a more responsible manner. Yet sometimes too much regulation can stifle innovation. It's definitely a difficult balance to find. Regulators, lawmakers, and the crypto community need to work together to figure out the best way to allow for ICOs as a fundraising mechanism to survive, but also to protect people who actually want to invest in the projects. So I hope that this brief overview was helpful in understanding what the SEC is and what they do. I also hope that you now have a better understanding of the latest debate in the regulatory space with regards to ICOs. As always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment if you found this to be helpful. Feel free to also follow me on Twitter at blockchain to me if you want to get more bite-sized versions of my daily thoughts on crypto. Thanks, and I'll see you guys next time.